I'm Bob Short, and this is Reflections on Georgia Politics, sponsored by the Richard Russell Library at the University of Georgia. We're honored today to have as our guest Louise McBee, who is a former educator and six-term member of the Georgia General Assembly. Welcome. Thank you. Good it's to a, be here. It's a long way from Strawberry Plains, Tennessee to Athens, Georgia. That's right. Please tell us how you got here. <clears throat> well, I uh, had uh, graduated from uh, East Tennessee State University, having been born in a little community called Strawberry Plains. Uh, graduated there, uh, worked a couple of years in, after I graduated, and uh, then went to eventually to Harvard, I mean to uh, Columbia University and got a master's degree and then to Ohio State University and got a doctorate. Came back to East Tennessee State and served for two years as the Dean of Women. And then the Dean of Students from this institution, the Vice President for Student Affairs, they were called, came to Johnson City and wanted me to come to Georgia. And uh, I finally agreed to do that uh, and uh, have been here ever since. That would have been in that would have been in 1963, and it was the best move I ever made. And uh, it's been a happy life here. Yeah. I was born in a little community, as I said, Strawberry Plains, uh, uh, unincorporated. My grandparents owned a farm there. My father worked for um, American Zinc Company, and I had two brothers. As uh, little children starting seven, eight, and nine years, we were close together. We carried the paper for nine years in, in Strawberry Plains. I, my, my dad insisted that we go up on the porch, put the paper behind the door. Uh, we had our routes divided, but uh, we learned a lot of lessons. We learned about people who would pay you, or people who would try to not pay you. Uh, Learned to save our money. We, it, it, we, we made 20 cents a week on the, by carrying the paper every day to people. And, and in Strawberry Plains, the houses were not in blocks. You walked long distances sometimes between a house for 20 cents a week. But it was, the, it was in some ways, we did it for nine years, uh, the best experience as a child you could have. You learned to take care of your money, to save enough money to pay for the paper for the next week. That's what we had to do. And then we would divide the uh, keep us a little kitty, we called it, uh, to take care of things, but divided the money so that we could use the 10 or 15 cents a piece that we would make during a week apiece uh, for ourselves. We learned to, to learn the people that would pay you, the people would try to avoid paying you, and so on. So it was, a, it was a good experience. We learned to take care of money. And we did that, as I said, for nine years. Um, we all went to school there, and uh, it was a country school. There were 15 or 16 in my graduating class. Only two of us went on to college out of that class. It was not a thing that you just did then. You elected and made, a, made preparation to do it. Uh, I worked during the summer uh, at, at, uh, in Gatlinburg as a waitress in a hotel. And then the next three summers, I worked at Oak Ridge. That was during the war. Uh, you had to have college experience to work in the job. I was with Carbon, Carbide and Carbon, worked all summer, lived out in Oak Ridge, and was there the night the atom bomb was dropped, having, having no knowledge of what an atom bomb was, really. But uh, they were selling papers as we came out of the midnight shift, saying that the atom bomb had been dropped. Did you know when <coughs> you left uh, for college that you wanted to be an educator? Yes. I, I got two degrees, I mean two certifications by my work. I was certified to teach in elementary school. They used to separate it. I, they may do that now, I don't know. But I was certified to teach by law in the elementary school and in high school. And uh, ended up one year, I worked one year in a high school in, in Virginia uh, and then came back to East Tennessee State. They brought me back to the institution there to teach. And I stayed there three years and then went on to my master's and my doctorate. What did you teach? A physical education. Physical education? Mm -hmm. Well, you're a prime example of uh, what a good physical, physical education That's major, right. major should That's look right. like. That's right. That's uh, right. Well, you came to the University of Georgia 
after the uh, crisis they had about whether or not to, to admit uh, Charlene and, and yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, that was all over and they had graduated. But the, 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 the problems were not over by any stretch. Uh, there was still some anger. Uh, uh, there still were not many blacks on the campus, practically none. The day I went to work, I was in, my office was in an in academic building that looked down on the varsity, which is a, at that time was a restaurant. And the day I went to work, the blacks, the African Americans, were marching around the, the varsity because they were not allowed to go in to eat. And I know I'm being bothered by that. <clears throat> and we continued to have demonstrations, small demonstrations on the campus, and very few students uh, on the campus, uh, black students. You've seen a lot of change here at the university. A lot of change, a lot of change. And it was under uh, uh, my administration as vice president, I had put one of my assistant vice presidents, associate vice president, to work. That was his job to try to bring more African American students to the campus. And he did. And not only the students, but prim principally faculty to, f to find <coughs> uh, African American faculty that uh, could uh, do the job on a college campus and try to, and, and I know we s hired several under my administration. <clears throat> you climbed the academic ladder here all the way to vice president uh, for academic affairs. I did. That was before your campaign for the Georgia legislature. Yeah. Well, I started, I came here as dean of women, and then I was made dean of students, which is the, the top position in student affairs and has the other offices under it. And I stayed in that a while, and then the pre vice president for academic affairs asked me if I would like to come and work in his office. We had just gotten through some of the demonstrations, uh, the Vietnam War, Kent State killings, uh, and I was uh, ready to, to, to try something else, having gone through that. And so I, having the opportunity open to me to move into academic affairs, I did it and stayed as an assistant and then an associate vice president for academic affairs and then eventually a vice president for academic affairs. Well, the academic ladder is not the only thing you've climbed. Tell us about Mount Everest. The, the year I retired, 1988, uh, I had a s student come to, that previous summer, come uh, to work with me in my yard to help me sod my yard. And he said, will you help me get permission from the Chinese government to go to Mount Everest? He was, I knew he was a climber, a young guy who did a lot of climbing. I said, well, sure I will. And he said, we'll take you with us. Just, and I considered it just a light moment. But uh, I did get permission for them t to go to, uh, to China. It got in the paper that uh, Dr. Stanford, who was the president, and I were gonna go with them. And so without no much, not much thought, more thought about what it would be uh, than that, we did indeed go. And uh, at that point, after we finished uh, the climb, according to the records, I was the oldest woman who had ever gone to the base camp at Mount Everest, which was 18,000, about 18,000 feet. And uh, it was a dangerous journey, one I never uh, would have dreamed would be as difficult as it was. But I did okay, and Dr. Stanford, who was uh, 20 years older than I was, or, or I'm not sure that, but he, uh, much older than I was, he made it as well. How did you get interested in politics? Uh, except that I've always, my parents always voted. One was a Democrat and one was a Republican, and we used to, they talk, talked about canceling out each other's vote. Uh, and we were, we always knew voting, or was told it was important, and it was your public responsibility to do it and as soon as I was old enough I registered to vote and and uh, but you take on a new interest in it when you get into academic settings where uh, the quality of legislators you get uh, has a lot to do with the support for education and so uh, uh, I had never th uh, had any intention of running but uh, 
uh, Lawton Stevens, who was uh, was in uh, well, was a legislator and lived here in Athens, uh, was called to uh, was made up made a uh, uh, what do you call it a Superior judge court. a judge, and uh, his sister called me that afternoon and told me just she was calling about something else that he judge said Lawton had just been made a judge he was in the legislature and uh, it, it had just happened and so I turned around went to as soon as I finished that conversation went to the to the uh, telephone and called the paper and the radio station and said I was going to run for his office some people had encouraged me to run for mayor of Athens they called it something else then city manager or something but I didn't was not interested in that and I had been out of my job at the university for a year or so and so I just uh, on on a whim I just uh, uh, almost uh, without really giving it much thought went and, and called and said I was going to run and then I called Phyllis Barra who was a big uh, a democratic delegate to the to several of the conventions and so on and was a friend of mine and I called her and I said I've done this what in the world do I do next she told me what to do she said sit down now and call everybody you can call this weekend and ask them to support you it was going to be a nonpartisan election which was good and so I did that I did exactly what she said and tell them ask them to support me and so I had a whole list uh, and I set me up a committee well, during the next week, to make things interesting, during the next week, Barbara Dooley called me and uh, said, would you come over here and talk with me? And I knew just as well as anything that she was getting ready to run against me. But I went over there, and she said that she had thought about it, and she wanted to do that. And she said, do you, uh, do you, what, about, what do you think? And I said, well, of course, I'd rather you didn't, uh, but it's your right, and uh, we'll have a good race. And so she got in it, and so did Chester Sosby, who was a well-known, popular um, uh, pharmacist at Hodson's Pharmacy. And uh, so there were three of us in the race. And uh, I didn't think I had a clue, a possibility of, of winning it, uh, certainly not outright, maybe on a runoff with three people. But I won the race, with, won, it, won it without a runoff. And I got 60% of the vote, 61% of the vote. That's the only time you had opposition. And I didn't have any opposition other than any, any time else. And I served for 13 years. That's a compliment to your service. Well, I hope so. I really did. Uh, I gave it my all. I, I enjoyed it thoroughly. Speaker Murphy, uh, I had heard about him and knew about him. Uh, he was a wonderful man. Unfortunately, not until he died did uh, the papers and all the people who knew and admired him secretly and privately uh, come forth. He got criticized probably more than any politician I ever saw in the paper, but he was a, he was a good, kind, honest man. And he was particularly uh, sensitive to, to women being in the legislature and tried to help them. And uh, so I went to see him when I first got over there. I knew my main interest was gonna be education. He put me on the Higher Education Committee and uh, so I had 13 years of good service under Tom Murphy. Well, not the last year I didn't because he got beat. He, got, he was defeated in his last run, the same time at my last run. I imagine with your background in education and your work here at the University of Georgia made you very important to well, the speaker and the leaders and well, the governor. I was uh, only one of two at the, that uh, when I got there, I think uh, there may have been others later uh, who had had who were tied to higher education. There were and just three or four in educate who were actually teachers that came out of uh, of that background. So uh, I was made eventually chair of higher education and uh, uh, certainly worked at a <clears throat> at a, a a crucial period in higher education because it was when the Hope Scholarship came along, and we had to. Uh, work with the provisions uh, and along with uh, President, I mean, uh, Governor, uh, who had been responsible for bringing it to bear. You know, uh, I, don't, I can't think of the Governor Miller. Uh, Miller, Governor Miller. And uh, 
So we're, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful opportunity to work with him and later with Roy Barnes in developing and expanding and uh, uh, testing after each year the amount of money we spend and what we could continue to do to give students more assistance and so on. It's the Hope Scholarship, in my opinion, was the best thing that happened to this state in, the year, in, that, in, the, in that century. Why? It kept the best, better students in the state because when they, when they had good grades, parents said, no need for you to go to wherever. Go, go here and go to, the, go to the university, go to some college in the state. And secondly, it gave hope and promise to students who would have never seen it as a, a, an opportunity uh, until they could, they could make good grades, but school was too expensive for them and they never saw it as an opportunity. Once that opened up, they, they and their parents saw it, and it, so it, higher education uh, became a part of their aspiration. Well, since uh, we've passed the lottery, and since the, the people have, have approved it, we spent a lot uh, more funds on public school That's than right. ever. That's right. Are we getting our money's worth? Well, uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, I, there's some data that are really interesting to me. It was Roy Barnes' data, but I expect it's still accurate. He says for every 10 boys and girls that grad, uh, go to college, I mean, they go to school, public schools, uh, six of them finish the great, uh, eighth, uh, see, no, uh, nine of them, 10 of them finish the eighth grade. Three of them go on to college. No, three of them go on to high school. I mean to college. And two of them finally get a degree. Mm -hmm. So we, we still don't have a high percentage. Uh, I may need to correct that data on it. I'll look to be sure that I'm right on that. And, but it's one out, it, it amounts to about one out of 10. We hear suggestions from time to time that uh, the state should provide vouchers for students in order to attend the school of their choice. Is that a good idea? Well, in effect, they have a voucher if they come out. Uh, if, they, if they come out with a B average in high school, they can go any college in the state. Mm -hmm. It may not, it costs more in some of them, and some of, some of the schools don't admit them, uh, but they can go somewhere in the state because private schools get it as well. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason why if they have, if they have done the work in high school, they can't uh, go wherever they want to go and uh, if, uh, where the college will admit them. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to ask you uh, your position on ERA, Equal Rights Amendment. Well, uh, I don't have any problem with it. Tennessee, I mean, uh, Georgia hadn't passed it yet, but uh, uh, why, why not? Why, why shouldn't there be? Why? Why not? Uh, so let's, let's go back for a minute to the composition of the Georgia legislature when you were there. For there my were, calculations, only 10% of the House of Representatives was female. Uh, it's a little higher now. I think it's maybe up to 15, maybe. Uh, uh, seemed like there, there were about 45 of us, mm -hmm. 40 or 45 when I was there. There are a few more now, mm -hmm. uh, but not nearly enough. But uh, countrywide, I think it's what, about 23%. So uh, aside from Arizona, we're, we do about as well as anybody, but it's not, uh, it's not high enough anywhere. Uh, that was one of the one of the things that uh, I admired about uh, Speaker Murphy. He gave women uh, leadership positions. Uh, he saw that they were listened to on on bills. He put them on committees that they requested and and had some expertise in, for like the children's and education and so on, and and tried to support them in their and help them with bills. He was, he was a great help to women. Uh, tell us, if you will, your role in educational 
legislation while you were down in Atlanta? Well, I had four bills that that are are my picks for what I have, uh, what I did while I was there. I'm going to get them so I can give you even give you the numbers of them. Uh, I, there, there, there are four that I take great pride in. One was House Bill 202, which gave teachers credit toward retirement for unused sick leave. No, no teacher in the state, man, man or woman, whatever, had got credit for unused sick leave whenever other state employee did. It took us two years to fund it, but Roy, uh, uh, Roy Barnes, Governor Barnes, helped me uh, get it funded by splitting it into two to two years. But now teachers get retirement just like other state employees, and that was that was something I, that I was really pleased to be able to do. Another bill was House Bill 424, which established a college saving plan. Uh, parents or grandparents can deposit monies tax-free in a saving plan that's managed by the state treasurer's office. Uh, and when the student starts to college, the money can come out interest-free. Uh, they've made interest on it, but they don't. They, it's theirs to use for that child's education. And we encouraged parents and grandparents at the birth of a child, as we, as I worked for the bill, uh, to 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 do that, to put a little bit of money in each into the child's plan that would be tax free so that they would be ready to go to college. Uh, the third bill was uh, the, the, the one that uh, the work that I did with the Hope Scholarship. After it had been in practice, we'd used it for a while in the years that I was there. We thought it needed a, a study and I led the study commission bill on that. And then a fourth bill that I worked on that not many people even knew about it, but probably did more for Athens than anything uh, in terms of their environment of Athens. And it was one that uh, there was a person who tried to set up a landfill, an arcade. The way it would have been, there would have been a truck every three minutes coming from all over the country, bringing in garbage to put in an arcade 15 miles from Athens. And uh, I was able to work on it in the House and with help in the Senate to stop that bill. Uh, the bill that I wanted, that for which there was, I had the greatest disappointment, was a bill that I had put in but that would have put a dollar tax on every pack of cigarettes. Why? Because there's all kinds of data that show that the cost of the, of the cigarette uh, is a deter deterrent, especially to young people. Uh, the bill that beat it was one that the governor, Governor, Bar governor uh, the current governor, uh, had in that put a 25 or 50 cents, 25 cents, I think, tax on it. My bill would have, uh, would have produced over $600 million each year and could, been a, could have been used for so many things and in addition, uh, kept uh, young people reduced teenage would have reduced teenage smoking. Mm -hmm. So that were those were the things that I was that I did in the legislature that I was most pleased with. Uh, and I was on the retirement committee and on the the uh, budget committee and on higher education. And those were three that gave me an opportunity to work for the thing that I knew the best. Uh, and to try to bring funds into the thing that I knew the best. Mm -hmm. The, governor, the uh, speaker was good in that he would try, if possible, to put you into committees where you could be the best advocate mm -hmm. and the best sponsor and know the most about it. And so uh, that, uh, that, that was what he did for me and, and I, f I feel like I, I did a lot for education when I was over there and particularly for the teachers in terms of getting the same retirement that other state employees had always had, and that none of us who had worked for it got. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we hear a lot about uh, our, st our students' uh, average on the SAT scores and uh, what is considered to be an awful dropout rate. Yeah. What can we do to improve those two and maybe bring them up to the national average? Well, of course, uh, we all know that uh, that that 
the best education the child gets is what he gets at home at starting at three years old when parents read to him uh, encourage them to read and and start with books and keep them away from TVs and so on uh, and so a part of the job is to educate parents and uh, uh, we have, and we have particularly uh, difficulty, I think, with uh, with that, where parents both work, and that, and the, and the, that's the situation generally in the poorest families. Both parents work. Mother has to come in, get supper, get the clothes ready for the next day, and uh, have all the chores of a of a housewife, uh, and not much time left to to work with the children. And unless unless children are encouraged to read from the time are read to by the time they're three years old, they say they never catch up. I've seen data on that. Uh, I, I, I don't know it to be a fact, but I assume since they put it out as, as a fact that it is, that unless a child is read to, starting at least by the third grade, that, they, that there's a, a lapse there that never allows them to catch up. And when both parents work, and, and, uh, and particularly in the homes where there's not help, uh, and, and homes where the financial situation is not as good, that's the place where they don't get read to. And they put them down in front of a TV set and uh, they eat too much and get too, too, uh, too much weight on them and, and, and don't learn the things that they need to, to learn to, to, uh, to get through. How effective has Governor Miller's pre-kindergarten program been? Well, I think great. We know from all kinds of data that uh, that the better the student, the, the earlier the start. And uh, unfortunately, at this point anyway, uh, there's not uh, not enough of them. There's students in this state who are, who who are eligible for it who who can't get to it. They don't have enough programs. But uh, the money is the uh, the lottery money is there for it. I, I don't know what the what the hold up on that is. But they say that there's still places that they don't have adequate kin pre kindergarten. Going all the way back to Governor Herman Talmadge in, in 1948, every governor has called themselves the education governor. Mm -hmm. Which one has come closest to being a true education governor? Uh, well, in my opinion, I, I was not here until in the 60s and I didn't know as much about it, but uh, in my opinion, Zell Miller, uh, because, uh, because of the Hope Scholarship, I don't think there was anything in that century that did for this state what that did. As I said a little earlier, it did two things. One, it kept good students in the state. They were going to uh, Chapel Hill and Vanderbilt and places, but the Hope Scholarship, when, when they were eligible for it, parents would say, well, you just stay here. You, you got that, you need to just stay here, and then you can put the money on your master's de degree and so on. So it kept the better students in the state, good students in the state. And secondly, it provided an emphasis and a feeling among the children who had not seen a higher education as a possibility. It gave them hope that that was a possibility and opened the doors to more people. There's no question about it. We've had, uh, what is it now, over 900,000, uh, over, maybe it's over a million now, who've, who've gone to college on the Hope Scholarship. And then it also encouraged students to make to make better grades. The the students who uh, saw that as a way to get into college, to to have help to get into college, to 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 do well while they were in high school. Besides education, what were some of the other issues you were interested in when you were in the legislature? Well, I asked to be on the retirement committee uh, because. Uh, uh, as I said, teachers, uh, I, I was the first one to get, I, I retired, I, I left the university without a retirement committee. There, there was no, it, I was able to put that in and, and work for other benefits for people, teachers who were, who were retiring. There's a thing going on right now that the uh, governor's behind. It's, it's a terrible thing. He's trying to take that one and a half percentage each, that teachers get each six months, make it optional for them to get it. Maybe you get it if there's money available. Well, there's money, there is money in that fund. There's $50 billion in that fund right now. Plenty in it, but he's, he's wanting to look at it for other things. When it's teachers' money who have gone into that with, with that idea, we have teachers now all over this state who've made $25,000 
and $30,000. That was their salary. Without that one and a half percent that comes uh, addition to their salary that comes now every six months, they can't make it. And and uh, uh, I have I've just came here out of a meeting where we are encouraging uh, them to write the committee that's making a decision on that, to to keep them in that where they don't have to where that can't be taken away from them by the governor. Mm -hmm. We have not had an education governor this time, unfortunately. He has not, he's a Georgia graduate, and I'm sorry I can't, I have to say that, but I must say it, that his in greatest interest has not been in education. Getting back to your service in the House, uh, who were some of the most effective members with whom you worked? Uh, Dubose Porter, uh, who's chair of, uh, or he was chair of the, some of the, the larger committees. Bill Cummins, who himself was a teacher, uh, the current Secretary of State, uh, I've, right now his name slips me, who was in the House then and was Gov Governor Miller's floor leader. Uh, Kathy Ash, who uh, is still there, she's into her uh, probably 18th to 20th year. Nan O'Rock. Uh, uh, those are some of the some of the ones now. Uh, those most of those are Democrats because I was there when the House was predominantly House and Senate predominantly Democratic, and certainly the leadership was Democratic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's not the case now, uh, and and I don't. So I've had no opportunity to observe them in the same way that I did when I was there. Did you have a mentor in the House? Uh, I guess uh, Bill Cummins, he had been there 20 years. He was a teacher. He was chair of the, of the uh, education committee and I served as associate, I mean as vice chair of it with him. He, uh, and he particularly knew public education uh, more than higher education. There were only, uh, uh, I think there were just two of us that were from higher education in the whole Senate, the whole House, the whole, the whole uh, uh, Senate and House. There were just two fa two people from higher education. I was one, and uh, a, 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 an African American from Atlanta who was at one of the black colleges. We were the only two f that represented higher education. You're also on the Appropriations Committee. Yep, and I fought in that for for education. That was uh, uh, first and foremost uh, my whole time over there was to do what I could for education. And unfortunately, that's, uh, it's, that has slowed down some uh, in recent years, and uh, not to our credit, mm -hmm. not to the credit of the, of, of the leadership. Uh, there are the, there are, education is job one uh, for, if we're gonna have a good state, it's job one. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we're just not putting the we're not putting the money and the interest and and uh, time on it that uh, that it deserves. Local school boards seem to be concerned about the governor's order to spend 65 percent at least of the state appropriations in the classroom. Uh, is that a good idea? Well, I would want to see the. I have not seen the the details of it. Uh, I'm pleased that he's interested in putting more money and, and emphasis on, uh, on, on education. I have not been pleased thus far with what has been done under the current Secretary of Education, uh, Kathy Cox. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know much, I don't know how much of it is uh, 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 interference from other areas, but it uh, doesn't seem to me that she has had the, uh, the freedom and uh, the energy, the direction or whatever is needed to, to, to move us forward in education. Uh, we don't, we're not graduating enough of the people who start in the first grade. Mm -hmm. And until we keep them through uh, t and graduated from high school, students, students who don't graduate from high school don't, don't can't get jobs. Uh, and we can never raise the level uh, of this state 
without working with those people in, 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 in uh, more deliberately and, uh, and, and putting enough emphasis on it that during their, around the seventh and eighth grade and freshmen when we lose them, they'll stay that long and then they pull out. And uh, we just can't, uh, we just can't, uh, the state can't move up with it's about, what aren't we, about 45% black and 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 a lot of that happens in the black community. They drop out and go to work. And uh, I've just been in a meeting where we've been talking about that. And uh, where if we could keep them in the technical colleges where they could learn a trade or some way to make a good living. Uh, plumbers, uh, electricians, those people make as much, make more than teachers. And if we could keep those students in till they were eligible to get into the technical college, uh, technical schools, they could go even though there there are co there are college level courses they can take now in the technical college, which I thought was a mistake, but it's done, so it's there. But there are also the technical routes they can then take where they can learn to be plumbers, and and electricians, and 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 areas uh, that don't demand high academic skills. But where the, there's a good uh, a good wage that goes with it when they get, get trained in those areas, has the federal No Child Left Behind Act been effective? I, all I've heard it, it sounds good, but I don't know anything it's done. If I've never, I have not seen any data that show it's been effective. Talking about the Appropriations Committee, are you familiar with the Green Door? Well, I always heard about it, but uh, I, it was not one I was ever behind or even knew where it was. Really? Uh, I heard Paul Brown was supposed to be on it, and he was from Athens. Uh, I don't know that I ever asked him about it. I guess if I had, he would have certainly told me. Uh, I thought it was more kind of uh, charm and, and uh, mystique or something than it was. Uh, uh, I, know, I, always, I knew that there was a meeting after we did appropriations and so on, and there was always one up in one of the one of the large uh, meeting rooms, and anybody could go and sit around the edge and try to hear what they were talking about and what they were saying. And I used to do that just to show them that I was there and that I was interested in what they were putting on it on higher education. But uh, uh, if there is indeed a, any kind of a room, a green room where the final decisions are made, I never saw it. But it could be, I think it's maybe another room, maybe has a different color now, but they still call it green, because in the time I was over there, I don't remember seeing any green door. It seems that uh, the General Assembly spends a lot of time on appropriations considerations. They do. And you were on that committee. Tell us how the state legislature appropriates our money. Well, there are subcommittees that look at uh, you know, that at different parts of it, that look at uh, 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 county governments and city governments and universities and public schools and, and different committees handle those and then it all comes back, funneled back in a, a, a later to a, to a full committee. Uh, and, a, and a lot of attention is paid to that because no one can, no one can know the full budget. You have to put people, the chairs of those committees who know about it and can can make wise decisions, and then they appear before the full committee and 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 make their case. And uh, I don't have any particular problem with how how those things are done. I think sometimes it's changed after it's been put together. I mean, when you think it's been put together, it, it gets changed that that I object to mm -hmm. or objected to that that the the green door, glass door, green door, whatever kind of door it was, that that have final say. And I remember the one who had a lot on that is now in prison. The guy from uh, uh, from, from uh, Augusta. Charles Walker. Charles Walker. He was the chair in the Senate and very powerful. What he said went and uh, I remember that last year he was there and I was on the committee, and how he would roar into the room and make pronouncements. Uh, as it turned out, you know, he, he was not uh, completely uh, ethical in his own 
private life, and and so I, he appealed for a, to be let out early, not too long ago, but it was denied. I think we have three in prison right now, from the legislature. That he's one of them. Another, the other guy was, uh, I had his name in some of my notes, uh, was all from the same town. He was Robin uh, Williams. Robin Rivens, that's one. And then there was one that was put in this past year, uh, just at the, uh, an African-American from there in Atlanta. Ron Sale. Right. Yeah. I knew all three of those. Uh, and uh, uh, when, that, when things like that happen, uh, um, it, it puts a distrust in the, in the, in the larger population. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the legislature at whole, when it mostly they're good, honest people who want to do what's right, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, I'm for locking them up and keeping them there. I'm, I'm angry enough that, at what they do to disillusion the public, the public about it, because a lot of people who are on those committees work long and hard and uh, and are honest and want to do what's right. How did you look at lobbyists? Well, I knew a lot of good people who were over there and, and gave, were able to give you good information, and I went to some of them when I didn't understand things, and they stayed, uh, stayed uh, uh, most of them anyway, well informed about uh, different bills and so on. Uh, I didn't ever have one influence me. I've had some talk to me, but uh, not in, effort, in any effort to persuade me to vote a certain way. They've asked me why uh, I uh, took certain stands on it and would I consider doing something else. And, uh, but I, they were always, most of them were past students at the university. That's what I found when I was in the legislature that uh, most of them, they knew me and I knew them. A lot of them called me Dean McBee because they had been students here when I was a dean. And uh, so, uh, and then uh, uh, it made it easier to work with them, having known them as a student, and uh, they're having known me, uh, and we respected each other, and and uh, it was a large percentage of, of Georgia graduates uh, in the legislature. The university has been very fortunate over the years to have some strong representation. That's true. Over there, including starting you. way starting way back with uh, Chapel, Chapel Matthews. Matthews. And then, of course, with Paul Brown, who was there 30, what, 33 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, part of that was while I was uh, there. Uh, the, the one who now has, certainly in terms of years, the status is, is uh, Keith Hurd. Uh, he doesn't uh, live in Athens, which uh, limits his influence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I thought you were supposed to live in the town where you serve, but maybe that's not the rule. I don't know. In the district. Uh, or in the district. Well, now that brings up a, an interesting thing that, uh, to me at least, is a reapportionment. Yeah. We've that, had several reapportionments, and each time there's always some sort of confusion and opposition. It's the most political, um, in my book, degrading, uh, dishonest. Uh, thing that goes on. What does it do? It, for example, the smallest town in, in Georgia is Athens, and it split it. Ralph Hudgens did it. Why did he do it? Uh, I don't know. He's never given me a good explanation. He said he thought it strengthened the city. Well, how do you strengthen it? But, and he uh, took the reapportionment away from Madison County, said it was not best for them, but then he divided Athens. I thought it was so he could get tickets to the football game. That's a good reason. Well, uh, I'd rather that didn't go in the <laughs> final version. <laughs> uh, is it fair to say that our legislative districts have been drawn to protect parties? That's right. No and question. For racial reasons rather than binding communities together. No question. To be Why apart. would you split Athens for any reason other than to, to uh, afford you a, a, seat in, a seat in it so it would give you leverage? Mm -hmm. No reason at all. There are a lot of the, a lot of the report. I, I, 
some states do it different. Iowa is one state, I believe, that does it different. I, I don't know whether I put in a bill. I think I maybe did put in a bill. I wanted it so much to be some kind of a, of a citizens committee that would work with the legislature. I don't, I don't know, I, I don't think the committee, if, if I, I'm pretty sure I had the bill drawn, whether it ever got, I, it didn't get out of committee if I did, but, but to stop that kind of, uh, of uh, unfair, unjust, wrong kind of uh, things like split in Athens, the smallest town in the state, mm -hmm. uh, for no reason, for no reason other than political reasons. And uh, so, and, and I'm sure there would be some uh, that go on, even if you had a citizens committee, but I believe it would be limited. Mm -hmm. Getting back to Louise McBee, you decided in 1994 not to run again. Right. Two reasons. I had family problems in Tennessee needed where I needed to be free to go back there and, and see about them. And then I saw that it was going Republican. I knew I would lose my chair, my, my position on higher education. And so those were the two things that entered into it. Well, speaking of going Republican, I'd like to ask you a question or two about party politics. Okay. Uh, as we all know, the uh, Republican Party has now taken control of the legislature right. and the governor's office. Right. What happened? Well, I really don't know. Uh, but that's when I uh, left Dodge, as they say. <laughs> uh, I, because I knew that uh, that uh, things were gonna uh, gonna going turn and that, that I would lose my uh, chair and not be able to do as much and as, and as I said and because of personal problems but I think we're going to see a shift back to a more balanced party this next year they may, the Dem I don't think the Democrats will take over but I think there will be more of them there. Mm -hmm. I may be wrong, I'll, we'll know t day after tomorrow. Yeah. But uh, uh, what interested me this year, uh, and I've asked several people and they have no explanation, uh, why so few had, uh, had opposition. Not one of ours had opposition. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I guess, uh, 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 the, uh, I know Keith didn't and uh, the other one didn't. Well, I don't think any of them did. Uh, Kouser, yeah, Kouser, a woman's running against him. That's right. Mm -hmm. Kouser, you know, the senator had a, had opposition, uh, not formidable opposition, I don't think, but opposition. Uh, well, why don't they run? One, uh, it's costly. When I ran the uh, uh, first time in nineteen was it ninety one or whatever, uh, I put up fifteen thousand dollars. Well, when Barbara Dooley got in it. I knew she would raise a lot more money, and I finally raised thirty-five thousand, but I didn't spend it all. Now they tell you up front you got to raise a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars. Got to have that to start with, and it'll take more than that. Well, a lot of people, and what that means, you got to ask people for money or put your own money up. I know one led one senator over there, woman, who put five hundred, uh, five hundred dollars, five thousand dollars of her own money up. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, you got to want it a lot to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was one of the reasons I backed off. And then I saw it was going Republican and I'd lose my, lose my chair. And, uh, and then I had some problems in Tennessee, so all of that together, I decided to back out. Some people, Democrats, believe that Tom Murphy and the House of Representatives was the key to democratic politics in Georgia. Do you agree with that? That's probably, that's probably true, yeah. With, with Murphy as the And, leader. yeah, but also a, a difference in population trends. Atlanta grew rapidly, and where'd they come from? Not, they didn't come from South Georgia, they came from all over the country. And, and the, that new, I think that new uh, mass that moved into Athens, I mean into Atlanta and Georgia, 
and particularly Atlanta, uh, uh, came from a came a, um, from Republican with Republican leanings, mm -hmm. and uh, I, it's going to be interesting. Some people are predicting Obama uh, will take Georgia this time. Uh, I don't much believe he will, but I think it'll be closer than it would have been a few years ago. Now, speaking of uh, that, uh, uh, politics in Georgia certainly has changed, uh, but perhaps not as much as politics in other areas. Uh, what do you think the Democrats need to do to regain their majority in Georgia state government? Well, I don't know. They think, I've talked to several of them. They think they'll take back a few seats this time. But if you've got a re Republican contingency, I mean, population around you, and you've got a governor uh, who pours money into it and, uh, and, and, and other people who support people in their, in their races. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed in yesterday's paper, uh, the man who owns the Falcons had given sixty-five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and it listed a whole bunch of other people. He just happened to be the name I recognized. Uh, did you see that where they'd given sixty-five thousand dollars to candidates? Yes. Uh, when uh, when when it gets that expensive, uh, uh, it it causes people to back off on running. Uh, and I, uh, I, I'm sorry to see that happen because uh, uh, it restricts people who would be good, good le legislators and uh, it tends to turn it to the wealthy or the people who have uh, influence and, and, and tend to leave out the more moderate and the poorer people. Some disenchanted Democrats uh, believe the state Democratic Party is too urban and too dependent on minority and labor support. Do you agree with that? Well, it's, it's probably pretty accurate. Uh, uh, and a lot of people are concerned about what Obama will do if he's elected in terms of the people who will have elected him and uh, what their expectations are, are for those, from those people. Some people, particularly Republicans, uh, are very concerned about what will happen to the country. Uh, with, I'm hoping he will have uh, a proper perspective on it and won't be, try to make too many changes too rapidly. But uh, there's some people think that he he'll be that he's a risk because of that, because of his promises to make life better. Uh, for for people who are poor, uh, and many of the, those are in this state anyway are are the the black. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll just have to wait and see on that. Uh, many states require party registration to prevent crossover voting. Mm -hmm. uh, should we do that in Georgia? I don't have any problem with that. I, I believe you ought to vote on for what you consider to be the best person and make party less, uh, less of a, an issue than it is. I know that that doesn't sound like somebody who's run as a, as a party person I, because you have to, but uh, I, would, uh, I wouldn't have any problem with, uh, and I vote, I cross party lines to vote. I vote for Republicans as, as often as I do Democrats. I voted for Republican uh, presidents. Mm -hmm. I try to vote for the person that I think is the best for the country. And I know that that's not, uh, not strong political ties, but uh, uh, that's, the way, that's the way I do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Do you believe in term limits? Uh, I've, uh, I'm, t I'm, I'm torn on that. Uh, generally, I do. Uh, I th I th but I think they should be lengthened to maybe to not just 10 years, maybe. But you know, we got people, that guy that's been stealing us blind in Washington that they just sent home, you know, has been up there 27 years or something. Like, well, that's too long, I think. Mm -hmm. 
as if you if you had a a procedure where you didn't rotate them all out at the same time. I mean, the, the, you'd have to get some kind of a pattern to keep the people with experience some experience in. Mm -hmm. But I think that some limit on it might be good. But you agree there's power in incumbency. Yeah, yeah, there is. There was no question, no question. Some people think that the one reason the Republican Party in Georgia has been successful is the quality of candidates. Well. Maybe I look too hard, but I've, I don't have to look very far to find a few Republicans that I don't think were good choices. Uh, I think our, uh, of course, and he's the first Republican governor we've had, in, in the, the current governor is the first Republican we've had. Right. And I believe people will, uh, there will be a Democrat the next time. Mm -hmm. Well, back to Louise McBee. Very wonderful academic and political life. Well, Did thank you. Did you ever think of seeking higher office? No, 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 I didn't. No. One, it, uh, the cost of it, the dedicated. I look at Jim Martin, who's a good friend of mine. I sat in front of him for 13 years and, and on boats and policies that I was not sure on. I discussed them with him. He's a good man. He is really a good man. And uh, I see the, the punishment he's had to take to be, have, have his life uh, criticized when he's been so good. Uh, of course, he's criticizing his opponent at the same time. Uh, I never did have to do any of that when I was running. And I would, uh, I don't think I would do it if I were running, but I, I would, I, I don't like that part of it where they uh, tell things about the other person that if they're not untrue, they're certainly bordering on untruth and where they're so in, unkind to the other person. Women are le do that less than the men, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think women are gonna be increasingly running for public office. And they make good candidates because they're conscientious. They're generally more honest. Uh, if there's been any dishonest woman put out, I don't know about it. Has there been from taking money? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Uh, they certainly are, are more dedicated and they're interested in things that we need to look at like family and home and children and strengthening the American fabric. Uh, and I think we're going to increasingly see, it's about 23% now across the country, about the same here in Georgia, of women in public office. But I think we're going to see more than that uh, uh, going into public office. And uh, I think it will put a, put a, uh, put a better quality on the, on the total body for having them there. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. think, don't you? Yes, I do, yes. If a young lady, came to you today and asked your advice on getting into politics, what would you tell them? Well, I would tell her that it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a very challenging thing to do. It's a costly thing to do. It takes a lot of your time. It uh, sets you up for criticism that sometimes hurts. Uh, but uh, it's a wonderful way to serve and that I hope they will consider it and, 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 and do it, knowing that those things are part of, the, a part of it. Because I think where women are, have been elected, they serve well and they perform well. Uh, I don't think I, uh, there's one exception to it right now that I'm concerned about. Uh, the Secretary of State, I, I've, I, th I think she has not, uh, uh, been as uh, accommodating as she could have been in trying to help people get to vote. I think it's important for people that they want to vote and need to be able to vote and to wait t 12 hours seems unnecessary to me. And she has either because of the regulations in her office but apparently just because of her own um, unwillingness or uh, to, to make any changes has kept people from who want to, to vote at very difficult circumstances where they have to stand hours and hours and hours uh, in trying to get other hours, the hours extended 
our, 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 our additional voting places. It looks like to me that we could do that when people are wanting to vote. Mm -hmm. Well, as you look back on your career, what has been your greatest accomplishment? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, probably in terms of, uh, uh, of s public service, and, and all of it has been public service, uh, whether it's higher education or uh, the legislature. In terms of the legislature, I think it was the, t the, the three bills, four bills, that, or really three that, that I mentioned to you in the beginning that I was most proud of. And then uh, in terms of uh, higher education, I think it has been to have been in a position, in a uh, primarily in a wonderful university, uh, where I had the opportunity to make it better, which I think I did in 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 my 25 years, and that I had been able to work with some of the leaders of this state and some of the best finest young people in this state, uh, who now themselves have taken leadership positions in the state, and. Uh, uh, and and it's a source of great pride to me when I see uh, students like uh, Kathy Cox, who's now the president of, of uh, Young Harris, and who was a, a very fine Secretary of State, and and then others who are over there now, who uh, that I had an opportunity in their young life to have some influence. Your biggest disappointment. Uh, hmm. Well, I don't know. Uh, I think probably it was a piece of legislation that I failed to get through that I thought w would have brought money into this state that it could have been used in so many ways and would have stopped people from smoking. That bill that I had that, that was a put a dollar on a pack of cigarettes for tax, they, I forget how many, just the 25 cent tax, but how much money it made, but I figured it was 600,000 a year maybe within, uh, in uh, tax money and would one, stop students from smoking, young people particularly, who another dollar would just be too much for them and uh, uh, so protect health, but also provide money that could be used for education purposes, not be able to get that bill through. How would you like to be remembered? As somebody who uh, was honest, open, uh, cared about people, and tried as best I could to do what was right. Well, thank you very much, Louise McBee, for being our guest today. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed talking with you. Good. Thanks. Uh, leave it. Leave it. Anything we missed? No, I don't think. You know, there's one thing that I didn't ask you to do, which I would like to ask you now, if you will, is tell us about some of your extracurricular activities that uh, have resulted in your winning all kinds of awards. Uh, some are education, some are community. Well, I won the first Regents uh, Award for Excellence. They, where they take you to Atlanta and, the, it, and uh, it's called the Eldridge McMillan uh, Trophy. But I, I got the first one. I was, that was uh, for my work in higher education. Uh, you're also a Fulbright Scholar. I was a Fulbright Scholar in Holland for a year. What happened over there? Well, I taught in a uh, hobby S for a, a high, a high school, a higher school. It's a, it's a higher level student, women students who were going on to university. I taught uh, uh, for a year there and then went to the Holy Land during uh, the end of the year and then traveled uh, in a car that I bought while I was there. A friend came over and we traveled all over Europe that next summer. So that has to be one of the highlights to have lived a year in Europe and taught in a wonderful school. I lived in the home of the master of, uh, of the, he was the uh, 
harbor master of, of uh, Rotterdam, which is the largest, was then, I guess it still is, the largest port in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then uh, climbing, uh, climbing to 18,000 on Everest uh, is something that, uh, at least uh, the data that I have seen, uh, there's no woman to go on that high on Everest yet. Mm -hmm. You uh, still do a lot of physical activity. Yeah, I do. I do. I was, I played tennis. I was still playing tennis on a team until uh, that when that car hit me and knocked me down at the in the shopping center. Mm. It messed up my rotator cuff and I can't, I can't do it anymore. The doctor said it was too bad shape. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't raise my arm enough to hit a ball down. Mm. But, but you do uh, like you do. Uh, uh, but I walk two miles every day and work in my yard. Huh? Swift water uh, canoeing. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I've gone several times down the Chatuga. You ever done that? You know, that's my home area. Well, I'll tell you, it's exciting. It's it exciting. Yes, it is. Yeah, I've gone done that half a dozen times, and then went down the Colorado River on a raft. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, uh, I've traveled all over the world. I, the only, pl really, the only place I have not been is in the Middle East, where uh, they they fight so much over there. You can't find the time to go. Uh, you know, but other than that, I've 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 traveled all over the world. Uh, do you still maintain an interest in politics and? Uh, oh yeah, oh, oh you better believe. Y'all see how many com I contributed to their campaigns. That's one of the problems. Uh, they I try to help local people, but the people that are running for office in Atlanta and for the legislature, they know that I was there and they're still there, and they so they want you to give money. Well, you can just give so much. Uh, but uh, yeah, but I oh, I stay interested in politics for sure. I was going to look on this page that I uh, was trying to think of things. And uh, I think I, I think I mostly told you. Uh, but um, I've had a good life. Well, you've certainly been successful. Had a good life. Had a good you've life. Done great had good deeds for the state of Georgia. Had good parents and two good brothers, and uh, uh, and I got a lot more I'm going to do. Bless you. I'm not through. <laughs> you may want me back in five years. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah, you're, no, well, you're very well respected and uh, have done great things for the state of Georgia. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, but uh, the state's been good to me. When they wanted me to come to the University of Georgia, I said no. And the guy, that Dr. Sorrell, came up there and he said, well, at least let us bring you down there one day. Uh, you know why I got this on, don't you? Yeah, you told us. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, I said, well, I will come down there. And so I came and uh, met all the staff and so on. And, but when I went back, I said, I don't know. But I agreed to take it. Well, after I got back, I thought, I'm just not going to do it. I don't want to leave here. And so I had to been meaning to call the paper and uh, I mean say I'm going to write up a reason why I'm not and it, it came out that I had been appointed and so I got stuck and I cried all the way down here but the minute I got unpacked from then on it was pure sunshine. Well, that's